Okay, so I was asked to talk about my research life cycle. Uh, I think I would probably say there is no such thing. Um, my year is never standard, uh, to be honest. So I'm, I am in a little bit of a strange place because uh, I'm just about to finish my future fellowship. Uh, the last nine years I've been on ARC fellowships. I'm about to transition to a teaching and research role for the first time in my life. Um, so all change on my research lifestyle, life cycle, I, I think. So um, my background's archaeology. Um, my passion is early human evolution. Uh, so you can see me there on the left holding a skull that I worked out the age of for my PhD. Uh, in the middle, that's me playing with the Australian synchrotron. I love gadgets, um, so I sort of apply for theme time and <coughs> stuff all of the time. Um, and then that's us actually doing some field work in South Africa. Um, actually, it's a baboon sleeping site. Um, but I also run um, a series of laboratories. Uh, I don't run this lab too, it just sits next to mine, and my students uh, tend to occupy it an awful lot of the time uh, doing GIS work and visualization stuff. Uh, I run the Australian Archaeomagnetism Laboratory, which uh, is an archaeological geophysics lab. So while my passion is hominids, I literally have just got off a plane from Sydney sampling uh, Aboriginal fireplaces under the old library in Parramatta. So uh, for a consultancy company, so it's a very diverse sort of uh, research cycle. Um, and then I have my human evolution sort of lab that I sort of run. Um, awful lot of my time is spent managing uh, a massive cohort of students, um, which has got a little bit crazy. Um, and also, sort of a number, I also sort of manage the research fellows for the department. So I do a lot of the management for the archaeology department with regards ERA last round and those sorts of things. So I've taken on those roles uh, because I've been sort of in that sort of research only thing. So um, I'm also having to realize these days that I've become more of a research manager than a research doer. Uh, an awful lot of what gets done with regards to research is obviously all those students. Um, that's sort of why I built the lab, it's great, um, but it does take some transitioning to get used to that idea. Um, I was on the magnetometer the other day and one of my students walked in and nearly fell on the floor and fainted because uh, they'd never actually seen me do it, I think, in the three years that they've been there. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, so this is sort of me, uh, this is my transition, so I'm just coming off this ARC Future Fellowship for the last four years. I've just been very lucky to get two lead ARC discovery projects starting next year, which thankfully are spin-offs for my future fellowship, which means the setup for those will be easier than it might be. Um, so I'm, you know, you guys are all familiar with um, ARC deadlines, I don't think I really have to go into all of that. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to having some sort of a holiday this summer, because the last three years, uh, even when I had my first child, uh, it was meant to build sort of paternity leave, of course I was writing about our sea grants. Um, so I'm very happy not to be doing that this summer. Um, I will be head of acting head of the department instead. <laughs> um, so yeah, all this sort of focus is a lot of working overseas, so there's an awful lot of logistics, um, big international projects, managing lots of overseas partnerships. Um, which takes a lot of time uh, and, and energy. Um, but I'm really sort of, you know, that's what I'm into. I'm like understanding early human migration, speciation, extinction, how we became us, how we ended up where we are. And the moment I'm concentrating on this time period about two million years ago in South Africa, where we get this turnover from what is essentially a bipedal ape with a small brain stands upright to the first thing that looks like us. And two years ago, we were very lucky to pull out a brand new skull from one of our sites that may be the earliest evidence for our genus Homo, which we're currently hoping that nature might sort of publish for us. Um, so, yeah, lots of exciting stuff going on there. Um, this is mainly where I've worked for the last 20 years uh, in South Africa, uh, a series of whole caves with lots of sort of fossil sites. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, so there's an awful lot of uh, sort of other work that goes into obviously getting permits, um, complying with the UNESCO World Heritage sort of legislation for everything that I export from the sites, um, rocks, even not bottles, 
all have to have export permits. They all have to be curated at um, the university. Um, we can't throw anything away. Um, so management and ongoing things like that is another sort of part of, of doing this. Um, the last four years, I've run a field school for, um, I set it up mostly for Latrobe students, but we've had students from all over Australia um, and internationally from the US, and we have students from the University of Johannesburg. Um, so we run that sort of June, July, that's, my, one of my, that's been traditionally my field season. Um, I didn't really need to do it between semesters being research only, but obviously to get students to go, you know, they need to not be in class. Um, we're expanding that um, to uh, a joint thing with the uh, Washington University in St. Louis as part of one of the ARCs uh, next year. Um, and this has been a very successful way for me to get students um, both from outside of the trope within Australia but also from overseas to so bring in international students in. Um, this has been a good mechanism for, for that. And this is actually what a lot of my stuff revolves around. Is, is the field school because um, I, you know, despite that I've been a researcher all my life, I actually do like teaching, um, and this is how I got into research in Africa. So there's a whole host of other things. I mean, we all sort of often focus on ARC, 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 and we've had lots of discussions. Um, you know, we had a research workshop for the um, for the school a while back about you know everyone's always forced to go for ARC, but you know people that haven't managed that yet. There are other things out there often in disciplines that perhaps people could sort of apply for, get you know junior people to get a uh, uh, leg up so that they've sort of got a record of getting funding and they're not going to get completely depressed every time they don't get sort of an ARC. I met some poor guy from one after and he's been flying for nine years, I think. So, so there's a whole range of stuff within my discipline, and these have been, uh, for me, these are they're basically around about 20,000 US dollars normally, and these are the sort of seed funding grants that enable me to do the research that gets with the ARC grants. So even though I get ARCs, I've had, I think, seven in the last sort of, uh, since about 2008, been quite successful, but these are the sort of key things for me to actually get that seed money to get set up so that I've got data that I can show proof of concept for getting ARC. So um, this is now, this is a Leakey Foundation grant, so uh, anyone that knows anything about human evolution will be familiar with the Leakey family. So they have a foundation that gives out $20,000 grants internationally. So we got one of those in 2014 and 15 uh, to excavate this one site called Hasakat, um, where we found what well, doesn't look very impressive, but that's the first hominid tooth from the site. Um, it's part of the motor. It's only a partial tooth, but hominid fossils are so rare, that's still a relatively sort of uh, significant find. Um, that is part of one of my ARCs now, so that shows a direct sort of setup from one to the other. We find lots of cool other stuff that people often forget about, we've spoken on humans. Um, it, has a, it has some of the best evidence for the evolution of clip springers, which are these weird little ballerina um, antelope that sort of stand on their toes and jump around on the rocks. Um, the extinct version of Haskar is like three times the size of the modern version, like massive, massive foot springs. Um, beautiful preservation, as you can see in those teeth there. So, um, people have often been asking me, how the hell did you manage to get two ARC discovery graphs? Um, <coughs> I actually, uh, actually, it's cheating because uh, one of mine was coded under archaeology, the other one under paleontology. <laughs> um, because I can do both. <laughs> so, um, there was a little bit of cheating involved in that. but. Um, so yeah, uh, <clears throat> this is another site. Again, we've got a National Geographic grant for about. Well, we actually got two um, in six sort of got, yeah, one, and then we got another. So this sort of pinnacle here is a pinnacle of tufa, which is just a, it's, a, it's a little bit like stalagmites, but they grow um, above ground. This is actually where um, an Australian anatomist from Queensland called Raymond Dart found the first evidence for humans in Africa in 1924. Completely changed our view of where we come from. Um, it's the first early hominid. It's about a three-year-old child. Amazing that he noted that that was actually human and not some other ape. But we've known, not known the age of it for that entire time. So we've had a project going there, um, and this was part of my, my ARC Future Fellowship to work out the age of that. And again, you know, I've had these sort of, um, of you know, this actually, one of these grants we got at the same time as the ARC, that was gave us that supplement. I mean, almost all of it went on quarterly, to be honest, because it's 
expensive business. So, um, so we just have also just submitted um, crazy, I know, uh, an NSF grant with colleagues in or we're in Hawaii. Um, so last year I went out for four days, um, and obviously we now have the China Studies Research Centre, which gives little grant again, little seed grants to go and do projects. So um, this this trip they sort of paid for me to go. Um, so we're working on a series of caves in sort of southern China. And this was sort of my backup because I've been applying for ARC to get one of those other ARCs that I just got funded for the last few years and kept not getting funded and I thought, well, do I need to fund and go into an area where people, the ARC might want to fund, maybe they don't want to fund Africa. So I felt, well, they might fund China. So I started this sort of project and um, I got invited to go and do this. So um, I'll be trying to squeeze this in during a week somewhere, and probably June, I suspect. So, um, but that's being funded through NSF in the United States uh, mostly. So, um, a lot of my funding for doing research actually comes from overseas. So, while none of that money comes to the trove, it does get me out into the field, gets me doing research, gets me publishing papers, and it's something that's often not often acknowledged within our sort of you know time and effort and CVs to a certain degree because it's not you know, Australian funding. Um, Australian Synchrotron, um, apply for this all of the time um, for various different things. Uh, it's a rolling sort of thing each year. It's not got a monetary value on it, but you know um, the amount, the beam time is sort of you know from a monetary amount quite a lot. Um, we have another thing called uh, AMSTO in Sydney, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. They again. Um, They've actually slightly changed the way they do it, but I get funding there for things like free radiocarbon dates. This was on a site in uh, Victoria. I've been the ANC councillor, so I'm on the, on the council for that as the literary representative for the last few years. Um, and these are sort of funny ones because they're sort of done as online portals. So people have to go and apply for them, and the university often has no clue that they've even done it because uh, people don't put their sort of submissions through, and that's something I've been trying to rectify. But to any great sense. Um, research consulting, I say research consulting, not consulting, um, with industry is a year round thing. So, literally, last week someone said, Can we fly you up to Parramatta to go and this is where I just got off the plane from? Um, with Kumba Consultants, they've got a load of Aboriginal fireplaces. Um, so, I do a lot of work on this. The lab works a lot with Heritage Victoria and various companies for doing this type of stuff. And that can happen at the last minute, um, but this, this can often be frustrating getting. Uh, yes. The timing of getting uh, all of the sort of um, invoices and things like that sort of done for this would be somewhat different. And we do a load of stuff, geophysical survey, 3D scanning, all these sorts of things. So we provide technical services for that industry. So, um, so I mean, as far as my ARC Future Fellowship, my year um, was just crazy. I mean, when I was research only, um, previously, I probably spent nearly eight months overseas sometimes uh, in the past, um, and it's it's just sort of hectic. You're just doing things everywhere, um, and then uh, I mean, there's sort of key things: um, ARC grant writing, obviously over the summer, um, preparing for field work, and then I've got excavations with like French groups, US groups, uh, China, then off to South Africa. Um, coming back, obviously backing up field days or all that sort of stuff. So being able to, that, I mean, that's been a big thing is actually having this massive amount of work that we do somewhere. Um, I can't say it's managed particularly well at the moment, so it gets dumped and backed up. But um, that's something that certainly uh, needs sort of maybe help with and fix it. Um, but I know that people are working on that. So. Um, and then, of course, we get into PhD honours submissions, PhD applications towards the end of the year, which is all crazy and compressed, sort of into sort of September, October, um, and then sort of you know various conference things. So, um, going forward, the One ARC Discovery Project is a massive, massive project with people in all over Australia, in the US, in Italy, in South Africa. So, a big sort of organisation. Uh, Go and find more of these guys. So, um, and then the second one is actually a much smaller project. So the the previous one was built for a four year thing. Um, this one was basically a two year thing. It was a sort of can I convince them to give me some some money to sort of uh, you know I didn't want to go for a big big grant 
Um, I just wanted to sort of say, look, this is a really cool site. Um, I put it in as a sort of lower budget, and then hopefully they give me some money to do, and they did. So, um, so this will actually, obviously, uh, this will actually be running in February now because obviously now that I'm transitioning to teaching, I actually have to be here during semesters. So that's taking a bit of readjusting to working out when I'm going to be able to do all of these things because I work with so many people overseas. You know, their timeline uh, for the year is not the same as ours necessarily in Australia. So um, I'm sort of stuck with February and then June sort of time period. Um, so this is sort of, I suppose, my hope of how I'm going to manage it, <laughs> um, which is equally crazy. Um, and I'll be helping to, I'm not going to be coordinating the course, that's been, uh, but I'll be teaching into three different courses. So I do have to be around for semester one and two. Um, so there's going to be a lot of juggling with that, um, really. Um, I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to handle that as yet, but um, I mean, for me, the biggest, I think, problem is how do I teach, do research, uh, and I manage those labs to the point that I don't have lab technicians. I am the lab technician, so if the equipment breaks, I'm the one that takes it apart and fixes it. If I can't fix it, it goes back to the Czech Republic or wherever else it goes. <laughs> this is one of the struggles of being in archaeology, which is, in, I think, in arts. Because I'm like the most sciencey person probably in archaeology, but then most people in archaeology are sciencey. Um, we have a lot of equipment and a lot of labs, but we're not within an infrastructure that is used to that, and that's that's one of I think our biggest challenges um, for research, to be honest. But um, yeah, who knows? Uh, anyway, that's probably more than my twenty minutes. No, 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 no. I hope that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs>